Legends of Atlantis speak of an advanced ancient civilization before the times of Rome and Egypt. We've all heard the name Atlantis at least once. And everyone knows the story of how huge waves swallowed it whole. For decades, researchers have scoured the depths of the Seven Seas in search of the fabled city. But time and again, they came up empty-handed. Because Atlantis was never beneath the ocean. Yeah, the advanced city was shattered by a cataclysm, and it was flooded beyond recognition. But not long after, the waters receded and left only ruins behind. Today I will reveal a theory that pinpoints the exact location of where the ruins of Atlantis lie, waiting to be found. We start our journey to find Atlantis by reading the earliest description of the lost city. The first accounts of the ancient civilization drift to us from the writings of Plato in the 4th century BC. In his works, he painted the city as a marvel of engineering and beauty. Let's hear it in Plato's own words. The city of Atlantis was divided into zones of land and sea, larger and smaller, encircling one another. There were two of land and three of water, which were turned as if with a lathe, each having its center at an equal distance from the center of the island, which was also the center of the temple. They bridged over the zones of sea that surrounded the ancient metropolis, making a road to and from the royal palace. Plato later described that the concentric circles of water had the purpose of keeping outsiders away from the city. At the time, the common folk who lived outside had not yet discovered boats or sailing, so they could never reach the city. That's how Atlanteans avoided the primitive tribes without entering into unnecessary confrontations. From Plato's first description, we learn what to look for. Big circular ruins, concentric circles, and signs of water in those circles. But we still don't know where to look for it. Now, please pay attention, because from Plato's next description, we will be one step closer to unveiling not only the size of the city, but also its exact location. They dug a canal of 300 feet in width, 100 feet in depth, and 50 stadia in length, which they carried through to the outermost zone, making a passage from the sea up to the city, which became a harbor and leaving an opening sufficient to enable the largest vessels to find ingress to every circle. Wait, wasn't Atlantis supposed to be an island? How could they dig a canal from the sea to their city if the whole city is an island? What if Atlantis wasn't an ocean island, but instead an island in land, crafted by human hands? What if it wasn't in the middle of the sea, but it was instead carved into the heart of a continent, surrounded by lakes or rivers? Think about it. Name one advanced leading country situated on an island. The UK, maybe, Japan? But that's about it. There aren't many, so the chances are it was probably on the mainland. The Atlanteans probably surrounded their city with vast canals and created a network of water rings that served as natural defenses. That made the city impenetrable. An artificial island on continent land designed not just for beauty but for protection too. The next part of Plato's description entirely changes where we should be looking for Atlantis. In his text, we find that the giant flood caused by an earthquake swooped all over Atlantis. Here are his words. But afterward, there occurred violent earthquakes and floods, and in a single day and night of misfortune, all your warlike men in a body sank into the earth, and the island of Atlantis in like manner disappeared in the depths of the sea. For this reason, the sea in those parts is impassable and impenetrable because there is a shoal of mud in the way, and this was caused by the subsidence of the island. What Plato was saying is that where Atlantis once stood, now there was an impassable sea of mud, which further confirms that it was never in the middle of an ocean, 
or at the bottom of a sea. Instead, it's somewhere on land, because there can't be any impassable mud in water. There are many other quotes from Plato, proving that he never claimed Atlantis was a standalone island, but instead a city on a larger landmass like a continent. In his work, Critias, he described Atlantis as a great and wonderful empire that controlled not only the city itself, but it extended its influence to parts of Europe and Libya as well, which is modern North Africa. This power came forth out of the Atlantic Ocean, for in those days the Atlantic was navigable, and there was an island situated in front of the straits, which are by you called the Pillars of Hercules. The island was larger than Libya and Asia put together, and was the way to other islands, and from these you might pass to the whole of the opposite continent which surrounded the true ocean. Here, Plato implies that Atlantis was not a small island, and instead it stood on land. When it comes to the water, he mentions several times that the Atlanteans dug a canal to the ocean, and with this canal they filled the rivers encircling the city. Since we figured out that Atlantis is on land, what about its location now? Plato mentioned it was close to the Pillars of Hercules. We now know this exact place and where it is. It's the Strait of Gibraltar, it's between Europe and Africa, right here. This positioning implies that Atlantis could have been a coastal or continental landmass with access to an ocean. Atlantis was never in the middle of the Atlantic. If it was an empire, as Plato said, how would you rule an empire from an isolated island? Plato also mentioned Atlantis was larger than Libya and Asia together. This makes no sense. With our modern understanding of what Asia is, no sense at all. There are no islands that big. But during Plato's time, he referred to Asia as mainly Persia and Anatolia. And the Libya he mentions isn't modern-day Libya, it's instead North Africa. So the size of the Atlantean Empire, according to Plato, was larger than North Africa and Persia combined. He believed Atlantis existed, and he wasn't the only respected Greek scholar who shared this opinion. Centuries before him, Solon, a distant relative of his, visited the Egyptian city of Sais. There, he met with priests who showed him records on temple walls and ancient texts describing a highly advanced civilization that once existed beyond the Pillars of Hercules. The walls and the texts are still in this temple to this day. You can literally book a flight and read them in person. The civilization mentioned on the walls of the temple was called Atlantis. It was an island empire that thrived many millennia before their time. When Solon asked exactly when, the priests answered that Atlanteans ruled approximately 9,000 years before Solon's time, until one day Atlantis was swept away by the sea. This is super interesting, because it entirely matches the timeline of the last extinction event that happened on Earth, the Younger Dryas. The Younger Dryas was a severe and sudden cooling period that happened roughly 12,000 years ago. It marks the end of the last ice age. During this time, Earth experienced an extremely rapid shift in climate. Within just days, the ice sheets melted and caused sea levels to rise. Temperatures warmed abruptly, which led to massive glacial meltwater flooding into the oceans. This is documented science, it's not fiction, it's not conspiracy or pseudoscience. The Younger Dryas really happened, it matches perfectly with the Egyptian timeline of Atlantis. Imagine Atlantis as a highly developed civilization existing near an ocean. We know from Plato's description that they dug a canal to fill in their artificial rivers with water from the sea. That means they were near the coastline, which is quite vulnerable to ice melting. Sea levels rose dramatically, and across the world the ocean swallowed entire land masses. These floods caused by the ice melting could have overwhelmed Atlantis, it could have drowned it beneath the waves and erased it forever. This catastrophe would have left survivors scattered, 
perhaps reaching places like Egypt and bringing stories of a great civilization. If someone really survived and reached Egypt, he would have taught them advanced knowledge in return for a good place in their society. It makes sense, I would have done the same, and the Egyptians' account of Atlantis being destroyed aligns strikingly well with the younger Dryas flooding. If Atlantis truly existed, it's plausible that its memory endured in the oral histories and myths of the Atlantean survivors. This explains why the story of Atlantis was preserved by Egyptian priests who claimed to have inherited their knowledge from an older, lost race. Of course, not all survivors from Atlantis would have reached Egypt. Some would end up in other parts of the world. Some of you might ask how anyone could survive something like that. I believe the ones that survived simply weren't in Atlantis when the flood happened. They were traveling somewhere else, somewhere distant, somewhere safe, and they had no home to return to after the accident. So they fled to the most advanced civilizations nearby, Babylon, Egypt, and the cradle of ancient Greece. Coincidentally, we have stories across various ancient cultures of mysterious people bringing advanced knowledge to humanity. People like Thoth in Egypt, who taught writing and astronomy. People like Prometheus in Greece, who gifted fire and wisdom. And in Mesopotamia, Venus emerged from the sea and instructed early civilizations in arts and laws, and he gave them written language. Notice where he came from? From the sea. And across the ocean, in Mesoamerica, Quetzalcoatl was said to bring agriculture and astronomy. And in Native American narratives, he also came from across the sea. So there's another coincidence that lines up perfectly here. From stories, we can pinpoint three myths of Atlantean survivors in one part of the globe and only one across the Atlantic, in the Americas. This means Atlantis was probably located much closer to the three nearby locations sharing a similar story. Greece, Egypt and Babylon. If a big enough flood to cause such destruction indeed occurred, the first thing we have to do to find Atlantis is to follow the watermarks it left behind. Of course, we cannot look around in the entire world. There are thousands of water stretch marks from floods everywhere. But in his writing, Plato said Atlantis was south of the Pillars of Hercules, somewhere alongside the coasts of Libya, which is what they used to call North Africa. Combining this knowledge with the flood marks, we now have a general area to examine in search of Atlantis. If we draw a wide line south from the Pillars of Hercules, following the coastline, and intersect this line with the ancient flood marks, we land on a potential location. Here, we are looking for something specific. Ruins shaped in concentric circles, and exactly where these lines meet, we find exactly that, Atlantis. In the 1960s, exactly here in the middle of the desert, where our lines crossed, some of the first astronauts noticed massive concentric circles. This place became known as the Rishad structure, or the Eye of the Sahara. It's a massive, naturally eroded formation in the heart of the Mauritanian desert. It spans 25 miles across, which is exactly the size Plato described Atlantis to have been, and it perfectly mirrors the layout Plato described. Alternating rings of land and water. Taking a closer look at the Rishad structure, remember how in Plato's description, the Atlanteans filled their rivers with ocean water? Well, this here is ocean salt and such salt deposits don't form in the span of a few days. For many years, there was ocean water here, in these circles specifically and not around them, which means there was dry soil next to them, firm land, exactly like Plato described. You see, there are no salt marks where the dry land was. Geologists say this entire area was under the ocean for millions of years, and that's why we find salt. But this cannot be further from the truth. If this whole place was under the ocean for a long time, 
we would find salt deposits all over the entire Rishad structure. But instead, we find them only in the circles where there was once water, salt water from the ocean. This here was dry land, just like Plato described. The outermost circle aligns with the size of Plato's Atlantis too, perfectly proportioned to the measurements he gave. The rings of the eye are unmistakable, almost too precise to dismiss. Geologists today, of course, think this place was shaped by nature, but this was never proven, and nobody knows how it formed in reality. And there isn't a single other formation close to this anywhere on Earth. And geological formations, no matter how unique, they repeat. So geologists might be wrong and it might not be so natural after all. Many skeptics argue that the circles of the Rishad structure aren't perfectly shaped. But consider this, they've endured 12,000 years. Powerful floodwaters swept through and broke the stones into ruins. And for thousands of years, the winds carved away at what remained. Over time, the once perfect circles of Atlantis could have warped into the shape of what we see today. What's even more intriguing is that the wind patterns in this area align perfectly with the damage. It's not hard to imagine that 12,000 years ago, this structure might have contained flawless concentric circles. The skeptics of Atlantis should consider this. For centuries, the legendary city of Troy was also dismissed as a mere myth. Historians mocked those who searched for it, until, one day, it was found in modern-day Turkey. Troy is real, and Atlantis could be, too. The evidence for a massive flood in this region is undeniable. The Sahara is littered with salt deposits. Water marks stretch across the landscape, and even whale bones and marine fossils have been found here, in what is now a desert. A flood of that magnitude would have engulfed this entire area. But as the waters receded, they would have flowed back into the ocean. And underneath, they would have left only remnants of Atlantis. So what else is there to support this theory? Plato described how only in the central circle there were two springs, which the ancient Atlanteans used. One spring of potable cold water and one spring of hot water. In 2011, two researchers, George Alexander and Natalie Rosen, embarked on an expedition to the Risha structure. Of course, they were familiar with Plato's work. That's why they excavated the central circle, and they discovered exactly what they had hoped for. Two springs of potable water. These springs are unique, as they are the only known sources of fresh water for hundreds of miles around. In addition to the springs, the two uncovered many, many relics, including ceramics, processed stonework, and the remnants of ancient ruins. Today, however, the area is utterly uninhabitable. It lies in the heart of the desert, where summer days can soar to 120 degrees Fahrenheit and winter nights can plunge to under 32 Fahrenheit or lower. The extreme climate and lack of sustainable resources make it one of the harshest environments on Earth. Yet, we still find pottery there and structures. This means someone lived here at some point in time. And most logically, this place was probably inhabited when the area's climate was better suited for life. If it wasn't, the people would have simply moved a few hundred miles east next to the ocean, where the climate was much better at the time. So the real question is, when was this area habitable? There's an easy way to find out. By examining the history of the climate in the Sahara region, we can discover exactly when could have people lived here. Normally. And let's see if that matches the idea of Atlantis and Plato's timeline of 11,000 years ago. There was a time when Africa was green, and it wasn't that long ago. Scientists recently proved that even the driest African deserts were green in a very large time period between 14,000 to 8,000 years ago. 
They call this the African Humid Period. At the time, shifts in Earth's orbit transformed the region into an oasis of life. At the time, shifts in Earth's orbit transformed the region into an oasis of life, supporting a variety of flora and fauna, and enabled human populations to thrive. The Rishad structure, located in present-day Mauritania, would have been a part of this green Sahara. The springs discovered by Alexander and Rosen are likely remnants of a much larger water system that once flowed through the area. Ancient humans who lived there would have had access to plentiful water, fertile land for agriculture and an abundance of resources, making it a hospitable environment for life. But around 7,000 years ago, the monsoon rains shifted and the Sahara began to dry up. It turned into a desert, into the desert we see today. Populations were forced to migrate to more habitable regions. They left behind relics of their once thriving communities. The artifacts unearthed at the Rishad structure, including ceramics and processed stonework, tell a story of this ancient civilization that lived here in harmony with a very different climate. This timeline exactly matches that of Plato's story of Atlantis. It matches the Egyptian timeline, and it matches the timeline of the Younger Dryas. All of this proves there was something here. But how does it prove it was an advanced civilization that resided here, and that it wasn't just some random prehistoric kingdom? If we look at the scale of this entire structure, it's massive. If this was indeed a man-made structure, it's so big that it's twice the size of Chicago. 600 square miles. Can you imagine primitive people building something like this? I don't. Even with just satellite imagery, we can go around the Risha structure and look for ruins. Check this one. These remains are so enormous that they are comparable to the Colosseum in Rome. The walls of these ruins are over a hundred yards long. On each side, there was an advanced civilization that lived here. How advanced? I can't say for sure without going there, <laughs> but I think at least as advanced as the Romans, or perhaps, who knows, maybe more advanced. Geologists believe this is a natural formation, and they might be right, but that doesn't rule out the possibility of a civilization building a city on top of it. They claim the concentric circles were caused by uplift and erosion. Over millions of years, the Dome of Ancient Rock was pushed upward, and subsequent erosion wore it down, leaving behind circular layers. We haven't verified this yet, but if it was indeed a geological formation, Atlanteans could have simply seen that and taken advantage by filling it with water. So, that doesn't disprove our hypothesis either. Regardless of what geologists say, we found artifacts and the remnants of ancient structures, so someone truly lived here. And from the climate changes, we know they did around 11,000 years ago. So, was it Atlanteans or was it someone else? According to ancient Greek legend and mythology, the god Poseidon had nine sons, and the oldest of them he named Atlas. And this Atlas became the king of Atlantis, and he ruled over the large empire. The locals in Mauritania who inhabit the regions around the Risha structure say, based on their oral myths and legends, that their first king reigned upon the land long before the biblical flood. And his name was Atlas, and in his honor, they named the largest mountains the Atlas Mountains. This story checks out, because the mountains exist, and they really are the largest mountain range in Africa. And the name of the city of Atlantis comes from the name of King Atlas as well, and so do the Atlas Mountains, and so does the ocean that the Atlanteans ruled upon, the Atlantic Ocean. A bit after Plato's time, the father of history, Herodotus, devised a map and he showed the entirety of Greece, Europe and some parts of Africa. It shows the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, it shows the world we know today. And look what is there, instead of modern-day Mauritania, Atlantis. 
2500 years ago, ancient Greeks very well knew where Atlantis once was. But we cannot take for granted just one account, just one map, it means nothing. So let's check the maps of ancient Romans at the time as well. They too had advanced maps, and they were separate. So, by looking at one of their maps, what is it that we see in the same spot? Oh, Atlantis again. So how did we suddenly forget this information? Why isn't anyone speaking about it? The only person that I'm hearing covering this and giving it some voice was Jimmy Corsetti on the Bright Insight YouTube channel. If you haven't checked his videos on this, please do. He was also on Joe Rogan, so check this out as well. He's asking the right questions. He's asking why someone is trying so hard to hide the location of Atlantis. And I think I have some of the answers. What do you think would happen if humanity suddenly understood that thousands of years ago there was once an advanced civilization like Atlantis, like us, and yet it still somehow perished, wiped away under the sea by a simple cataclysm? Would we panic at the realization that human civilization has been reset, not once, but potentially multiple times throughout history? Earth has been around for over 4 billion years, and for a significant portion of that time it has been capable of supporting life. We think that advanced civilizations like ours have existed just for a few thousand years. Now imagine how many cycles of life and death and civilization would have risen and fallen in the vast expanse of Earth's history. For over 550 million years, animals roamed our planet. Modern scientists think we humans have been here for not even a million years. What about the remaining 554 million years? Could other advanced civilizations have existed during that large period of time? We know Earth has undergone massive extinction events. At least five major ones are recorded in the fossil record. The asteroid impact that wiped out the dinosaurs 66 million years ago is the most famous one. But there were other, like the Permian-Triassic extinction event, which was 250 million years ago, and it obliterated over 90% of all life on Earth. Each of these events erased life on an almost unimaginable scale. It reset ecosystems and it potentially wiped out any evidence of intelligent civilizations that may have existed before us. If such an event were to happen today, a global cataclysm like an asteroid impact, or a supervolcanic eruption. It's very sobering to consider how fragile our trace might be as a civilization. After a thousand years, all of our structures, from skyscrapers to simple homes, they would crumble under the forces of nature. After just 10,000 years, only a few artifacts buried deep underground would remain. And after a hundred thousand years, even those would vanish completely. Civilization, as we know it, would leave no trace visible to anyone or anything that came after us. It's entirely plausible that Earth has hosted multiple advanced civilizations in the past, and each was wiped clean by time and catastrophe. Perhaps some of these became too advanced, advanced enough to leave the planet, venturing into the stars, Others might have simply succumbed to their own wars or to cataclysms. Some could have been obliterated by natural disasters. The truth is, Earth has cycles, long, slow rhythms of creation and destruction. And while we like to believe our technology and knowledge make us immune, we're just a fleeting moment in a planet's vast history. We often see ourselves as the pinnacle of Earth's history, but the truth is, we are simply one chapter in an epic book that has been written and rewritten countless times. Perhaps the ruins of these other civilizations are buried beneath the oceans, under thick layers of sediment, or reduced to dust by time. If we ever found evidence of such civilizations, how would it change how we see ourselves? Would it humble us? Would it terrify us? I don't know, but perhaps those in charge don't want to find out. This is one of the few far-fetched theories that after diving into, 
aren't so far-fetched after all. Atlantis probably really existed. Was it in modern-day Mauritania? I think so. Might be. And the thing that convinces me the most is how hard someone is trying to hide it. The Richard structure is so geologically unique that it should be listed as a part of the seven wonders of the natural world. Yet most people have never heard of it. And nobody is pushing it into the light. Mainstream media and mainstream narratives avoid it. And they try to cover it up. Probably because it contains something that would rewrite our history as a civilization. If it weren't so dangerous to go there, I would probably go right now and dig. Because I believe the signs are there. I'm Danksu Isoko and thank you for watching Into the Unknown. Thank you to all the members of the channel. To support us, please subscribe and hit the notification bell. It really is great help, because the algorithm doesn't always quite show our content for whatever reason. Maybe you tell me in the comments. And if you liked this episode, I am sure you will also enjoy my deep dive into another lost empire. Great Tartaria, a country that was erased from the map by a conspiracy so large, it defies everything you know about history. See you there.